Well, this morning we're going to be talking about the consequences of hypocrisy. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be here this morning. I'm really blessed to be able to be here this morning to talk to you guys from the Word. This is one of my favorite things to do, even though I am, you know, riddled with anxiety in the morning beforehand and the night before and pretty much 24 hours a day thinking about it. Um, but this is something that comes probably as no surprise to, to all of us that some of us deal with hypocrisy on some kind of level almost every day, okay? But I wanna give us an example of one in particular that we would immediately recognize if you, um, if you know this example, great. If you don't, that's also okay. Um, if you look on the screen, you'll see a picture of this man right here. This man is named Lance Armstrong. And this is a man who lived years and years and years as a hero, as a, as a superstar, because not only did he win seven straight Tour de France's, which is the hardest cycling competition in the world, won seven in a row that nobody had ever done before, but he also did it after going into remission with cancer. Okay, so he started this organization called Live Strong, and they've done a lot of good for cancer research around the world. But Lance had a dirty little secret. Lance was living a double life. Yes, he was doing these incredible things on, um, you know, in his sport, but he was cheating. During the, the entirety, even before he had cancer, he was using performance-enhancing drugs to make himself better. And he had come up with this elaborate system to trick drug tests so that they never detected it. It wasn't until 2012, well after he had been done, that he finally was caught. And then in 2013, finally admitted on a TV interview that he had done it, that he had been lying the entire time. Because every time an accusation came up, he always flatly denied it, just said, not true, not true. I am not doing this. So this man was living a double life. He was pretending to be one person while he was a completely other person in secret. And if there's a, actually a, um, an ESPN documentary about Lance, and it does not paint him in a very pretty picture based on the people who had brought up the original accusations. And so like Lance, we start, we can, we can do this, not on maybe that scale, but even in little things where we might say, they might justify these little hidden actions. We are, humans are so good. We're so good at justifying and rationalizing things that we know are not right. That, you know, that we're doing things we know aren't good. We know they aren't um, right for us to be doing. And this is hypocrisy. We know this. Each and every one of us struggle with this on some level. Um, and we can define hypocrisy like this. Going or acting against your conviction. So you might have a conviction inside of you that you know to be true, but you will act against it, whether you are trying to please people or that particular choice just looks um, good at that particular moment. And so this can, hypocrisy can be revealed in two very distinct ways. It can be revealed either as a hiding, okay, where like Lance, you are hiding from sin. You are trying not to let certain things be made uh, visible, made public for everyone else. So you are living this life in hypocrisy where you are, you know, one person in secret or one person in public. Or you could be a person that elevates yourself, that thinks very highly of yourself, believing that the good that you do makes you a really good person or even to an extent makes you a better Christian, a better follower of God than anybody else. And those both are major forms of hypocrisy. And I'm telling you this morning, hypocrisy has its consequences, has major consequences. So this morning we're going to look at a story that Paul is kind of telling. And there's a lot of material that I'll be covering this morning but Paul is, he confronts the Apostle Peter, the Apostle Peter, about some um, hypocrisy that was in his life. And so we need to learn and see from Peter's hypocrisy what the consequences are and how we can learn to live um, as a result from it. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to summarize, first of all, kind of how we get here. I'm, I'm covering all of chapter two in Galatians. So I invite you to turn there right now. I invite you to pull out a smartphone if that's what you use. Um, if you need one of the brown hardback Bibles that are in the chairs um, in front of you, uh, it's on page 1168. If the Bible is something that's new to you, we invite you to turn there. And so what you have in the And I'm just going to summarize, get you kind of set up into the situation here of the story. Second half of chapter one into the first half of chapter two, Paul is kind of giving a story, kind of defending where he got the gospel from. So we can summarize the beginning of chapter two like this, that Paul comes after 14 years. This is 14 years after his conversion. He brings his friend Titus, and there's this conflict with some people that he calls false brothers. And what they were trying to do is they were trying to put on to Titus, who was a Gentile, Jewish laws like circumcision or food laws. And the apostles validate Paul's belief that says, no, these do not have to be added. Because of what Jesus did, we are now free. We do not have to follow the law to a T. The law cannot save you. The law cannot make you righteous before God. Okay, so, the, so they validate Paul's message, and there's, there's a huge reason why. Because there were these guys that were called the Judaizers that had come into Galatia, and they had made a couple claims about Paul. So I have a quick, I have a table on the screen for you to look at on the next slide of what the Judaizers were claiming against Paul. First of all, they were claiming that he had received the gospel from the apostles, but then he had distorted it, okay? And his distortion was this, you are free to, you you, you are not obligated to follow the Jewish law in order to be a Christian. And this was for the Gentiles because the Jewish law is huge. Um, Brace yourself, the Jewish law has 613 laws to follow. Can you imagine trying to do that every single day? That would be really difficult, okay? So Paul, his defense in chapters one and two for himself, he's, he gives us a clue and he says, look, I got this straight from Jesus, this gospel. And if some background information, Acts chapter nine tells us about that, how Paul received the gospel from Jesus, shining light on the road to Damascus, Jesus spoke to him. Don't think any of us have ever had an experience quite like that before, okay, where Jesus comes in and speaks very clearly, okay? So he says, no, I didn't get it. He didn't actually meet the apostles until three years. He says this in chapter one. He didn't meet them for three years after his conversion, okay? So he didn't get it from the apostles. He got it straight from Jesus. And not only that, but the apostles have validated his message. Look at verse six. At the end of verse 6 of chapter 2, he says, they, they, meaning the apostles, added nothing to my message. Basically meaning, we approve it. This is good. You are preaching the right thing. And so in that beginning part of chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, he talks about how the apostles validated his message and extended what, what they call the right hand of fellowship. Basically saying, we believe you, we we." say you are teaching the same gospel message and we are sending you out to go and preach to the Gentiles, which are non-Jewish people. And we, the apostles, are feeling more, are, are called to the Jews. So they're blessing them. They're saying, go for it, okay? But if you've been in church long enough, you know that conflict tends to arise people. And just being a human being, conflict arises with people in general. Okay, so Peter eventually comes to visit Paul. And here's something really important that we have to remember about Peter, some more background information. Peter got this vision in Acts chapter 10, where a sheet comes down, and there are all kinds of animals on there that were considered unclean. Okay, and, I'm, and I, I believe this fully, that there was most certainly a pig coming down because pigs were like no go. And so we can thank God at this point that now bacon is a fair game for all of us. Thank you, Jesus. We love bacon. Okay. And so Peter 
sees this vision and God just tells him, it's not just, like this is, this is a picture. This is not just this idea that, you know, you are now free to eat whatever you want, okay? Because Jesus fulfilled the law. But it's a statement of saying, also Gentiles are part of God's plan. They are welcomed in. They are a part of the whole deal. Unless you have some sort of Jewish heritage that I don't know about, I'm guessing all of us here are Gentile, okay? And, and so God has opened it up and he's telling them, look, there are no restrictions. The law has been fulfilled. You don't have to follow these particular laws in order to be a Christian. There's no condition upon it except having faith in Jesus. That's the only condition, okay? And so Peter, of all people, should know. He should know that this is the point, that this is what the gospel is all about. And so we look, we're going to read verses uh, 11 through 14 together real quick. We're also going to read, we're going to read it piece by piece as we go through. So uh, I invite you to look down at your um, Bibles right in front of you and we'll, we'll begin verse 11. When Cephas, that's Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? So Peter most likely heard about what was going on in Antioch, this Gentile city where Paul was ministering and sharing the gospel and seeing you know, people come to Jesus. And when Peter comes, knowing that vision that he had had, he joins in with them and he starts eating and living the way that you know, a Gentile lives as, you know, as Christians. He's free. He doesn't have these laws on him anymore. But eventually, James, and what some uh, Bible scholars think happened here is that James heard about what was going on, heard about what Peter was doing, and got concerned. And so he sent an entourage of people, some of his friends, and they came in and saw what was going on and said, no, this is wrong. Okay, this is wrong, Peter, what you're doing. You are not supposed to live like this. You still are um, bound to the law and must follow what it tells us. And so Peter, seeking to please people more, starts to back away, starts to distance himself. Okay, because it wasn't necessarily that it was wrong for a Jew to eat with a Gentile. It was what they ate. And so a Jew could eat with the Gentile, but they needed to make sure that their food was prepared separately, okay, to avoid any cross-contamination, okay, to fully adhere to the food laws, all right? And, but Peter starts to fully separate himself back away. And you can imagine, I want you to imagine this. Imagine being a Gentile Christian in this community. You've been spending time with Peter, this man who has spent quality time with Jesus, okay? And he's telling you all about the gospel. You're learning and you're learning. And then he starts to back away and distance himself from you. Wouldn't that hurt? Wouldn't that be something that you would feel kind of um, discouraged by? You'd feel hurt that Peter had, you know, because of these other people had kind of backed away. And so Peter is living in this way where he's destroying relationships. And, what, and so this is our first consequence. Our consequence is, uh, of hypocrisy. First one is hypocrisy destroys relationships within the church. Because what Peter is doing is by separating himself, he's now creating divisions. He's now creating a, an area where someone could say, oh, because I follow the law, I'm a better Christian than those Gentiles who are not following the law. And that's wrong. There, there's no conditions. There's nothing there. There's no way. There's no like marker that says one person is a better Christian than another. We have all been saved by grace. But if you notice that Peter's sin here, and this is sin, Peter is affecting other people. 
I think a lot of times, especially if, if you're in the camp of hypocrisy, of hiding your sin and trying to hide from people and not let other people see what's going on inside of your heart, you're saying, no, you know, the sin that I, I commit, you know, it, it doesn't affect anybody. There's no problems. It's not going to hurt anybody. It's just me and what I deal with. But sin, sin is like cancer, okay? And it infects your heart and infects your soul, destroys the work of God in your heart. And so inevitably, that's, gonna, that's going to affect your relationships. That's going to change the way that relationships happen. And there's going to be fractures. There's going to be divisions, okay? It's going to be harder for you to be closer to the people around you. So your, your sin doesn't just affect you. It affects all the people around you. And, you, and I'm telling you, I'm not telling you this as like a, a turn or burn kind of uh, sermon, um, I'm telling you this because this is an invitation to stop the hiding, okay? But you could also have it infect your, or affect your relationships and destroy relationships by having that idea that because you follow more closely the rules of, of Christianity, that you are a better Christian than other people, and that doesn't allow for humility, and that doesn't really allow for real relationships. Um, we've talked about this in the youth group before about... Um, people who elevate themselves and whether or not those are really um, enjoyable people to be around. And I'm guessing if you've been around a person that, you know, always has the one up story, that those aren't exactly the most enjoyable people in the world. I had friends like that in high school. I, I tell my story and it's like, you could see them wait and then just bam, they drop their story that's better. And it's like, oh, great, thanks for that. I appreciate that. <laughs> you just ruined my story. I'm quoting a comedian here, uh, Brian Regan, by the way, when he says this, but, but it's like, yeah, yeah, you, 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 me, all right? I'm better than you. You're just, there. people are chomping at the bit, you know, to tell their stories, how they're better than you. So that destroys relationships. You can't possibly have a good relationship with anybody if you're constantly going, I'm better, I'm better, I'm better. And I'm not talking just like verbal, mental too. Because we do this. Every human being does this. A little bit of a game of comparison. And it's to kind of calm our own anxieties, calm ourselves to make ourselves feel better. You know, where we look at somebody and go, oh, look at what they're doing. I, I don't do that. That's what you're doing. Bam, you are putting yourself above another person. And so Paul calls out Peter for this hypocrisy. He calls him out. Look at what he says, verse 14. You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? What he's basically telling them here is you're changing the whole thing here. You're changing the gospel. You're changing the story. You're trying to make it so that it, it fits in with what these other people want. You have come here. You have lived like a Gentile in the freedom that you know that we have. And now you're suddenly going to you know, change your tone and switch and you're going to ask people you know, Gentile people to live like Jews? Do you think that's really going to work? That's hypocritical because you, you were living like a Gentile and now you're going to switch? That doesn't work. That's not how this system works. And so that's our first consequence. Hypocrisy destroys relationships within the church. So our second consequence is that um, Hypocrisy distorts the truth of the gospel. We're going to look at verses 15 through 18. I invite you to read these um, along with me. We, are, we, we who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not je justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law no one will be justified. But if, in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I, would, then I really would be a lawbreaker. Paul here is going to kind of belabor the point here. He's going to, Peter should already know this gospel. And, and let me tell you, as a Christian it's good to be reminded of the gospel over and over again, even if you've heard it a thousand times. Maybe that thousand and first time is going to change your heart a little bit more. But what Peter is doing here, by, he's putting these conditions. So when you put a condition on somebody, it changes the gospel. Now it's not this free offer of 
grace that God has bestowed upon all people. Now it's this little bit of condition. And what happens is it actually becomes like every other religion in the world. And let me tell you, there is this crazy, crazy thought that's going around in um, secular colleges and universities and even in philosophy that are trying to say this idea that all religions are the same, teach the same thing. And there is no way that this is true because here's how it goes. Every other religion creates some semblance of a to-do list or a checklist that says, if you follow these certain laws, do these certain rituals, do these certain things, this is what's going to make you right before God, or this is what's going to make you reach enlightenment, um, nirvana, you know, some sort of things. You reach the mountaintop, okay? Christianity teaches something else. Christianity teaches that mountaintop is unattainable on your own works. You cannot possibly reach it on your own works. You can't. It's, nobody can do it. Nobody can be perfect. But God came down in the form of Jesus, and he lived that perfect life, and he died on the cross for our sins to give us access so that we could come up to God. And so by Peter putting in these, you know, conditions, then makes it like every other religion in the world. And so if you're a kind of person that is in this camp of, you know, elevating yourself, you have pride, and I'm telling you, I am, this is probably one of the biggest struggles in my life is pride, thinking um, that I'm better than I actually am. Um, if you're in that kind of, if you're in that camp, you're putting conditions on other people to be saved. You're changing the gospel. You're distorting it so that it makes you look better, makes you look like you're a better Christian than other people. Or you could be in this other camp where you're hiding your sin. You're keeping away from Jesus and thinking by somehow, by some, you know, your own effort, you can fix yourself. I'm telling you, from vast amounts of experience, you cannot fix yourself. You cannot do it. And we'll talk about that more um, in a little bit. But the gospel, with what Peter's doing, he's distorting it. How he's living. He's putting conditions. You can't put conditions on it. All right? Let's look at verse 19 verse through 21. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. Here's one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The, not, the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. So again, Paul is continuing his point, and the gospel can get very diluted when we start to act in hypocrisy. It can be this thing where either, either camp, it really boils down to one similar thing, that your own work can make something of yourself before God. Okay? But what the beauty of what the gospel is all about is that you didn't do it, Jesus did it. Look at what verse 20 says. For I have been crucified with Christ. And that I is not, Paul is not talking literally, obviously, because he's still alive, okay? He's talking about this old self, the I, the old, the old sinful self, the sinful nature that, you know, that Christ, when he died on the cross, it wasn't just this substitution thing that he died on our behalf, which is absolutely true, but it's also this idea that he was like a scapegoat, that he took on all of our sin, all of our iniquity, all of the, all the things that we've ever done, okay? Past, present, future, all of it's been paid for. Jesus died for that and it was crucified with him okay and then it was buried in the grave and then notice what Paul says next after this that statement he says and I no longer live but Christ lives in me this is the beautiful thing of what the, the Christian life is all about and where again this makes a total distinction from every other religion in the world is that when Christ died he took our old self, our old sinful nature, he took it into the grave with him when he died. But when he rose again, he left it there. So your old self, that old self that you have, that you have been in the past, your old sins, your old um, 
Even those things that you, if, if you're in the hiding camp that you're hiding from people or your pride by elevating yourself, either one of those, those are dead and buried in the grave because of what Jesus did. And now you have Christ's life truly living inside of you. And it's a deeper, deeper concept than um, having Jesus in your heart. It goes way deeper than that. It goes to this level of like, you have Christ's life living inside of you. You now have access to a power to live beyond yourself and beyond the way of your old self. It's gone. And so what hypocrisy does is it, this is consequence number three, our last consequence for the morning. Hypocrisy diminishes Christ's activity in your life. Because again, in either camp, what you're doing is you're trying to muster up yourself, trying to make yourself better, trying to make yourself able to attain to, to perfection, to godness, to righteousness, whatever it could be. You're trying to reach it. You're trying to get there. And I'm telling you, it's not possible. Because look, look at what Paul says, verse 21. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. And so what he's saying is, is if someone somehow, some way across the world could somehow follow the law so perfectly that they never needed Jesus, then Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is pointless. It's pointless. Christ died for nothing if somehow we can make ourselves right with God, if we can follow these certain conditions. And here's the beauty of what the gospel is all about. Because we get to this point of the gospel where we start to say, you know, it's just, I, I'm forgiven. God has forgiven me. Great. That's awesome. I can now kind of, you know, live and do whatever I want and I'm fine. The gospel's not a get out of jail free card. The gospel is a life changing, life altering thing that comes into your life and now, like I said, you have Christ's life living in you. And what that's supposed to do is supposed to transform. It's supposed to change. It's supposed to radically make you more like Christ. We'll talk about this in many weeks. Galatians chapter 5, when, he talks about the, when Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit, there's a line that he says after the fruit of the Spirit. He says, against such things there is no law. So he's basically saying, having Christ living in you, now you are enabled to live the ideas of the law. That this is now something that you are able to do because of Christ living inside of you. Okay? And again, it's not a condition kind of thing. It's a response. That because God has worked in your life, God has changed you. You now want to follow him. You want to obey. You want to be a part of the church. You want to be a follower of Christ. And I'm telling you, if that is something that is hard for you to imagine, to want that kind of life, I'm telling you, it's available. It's available to every single person. It's available to you if you've gone to church your entire life. You can have the life of Christ even change you now this morning. It doesn't have to be something that you did once when you were five years old, though that is extremely important. It can be something that you access day after day after day. Or if you're a person that's really struggling with the hidden sin that's in your life, you, could, you can access God to give you the grace to move past those things, to get through it. And I'm telling you, I'm, I'm offering, or I shouldn't say I'm offering, Jesus is offering you a way to come. Come to him. Jesus' arms are wide open. One of my favorite parts about the story of the prodigal son, okay, when, he, when the prodigal son comes up to his father, the father runs to him. In a Middle Eastern culture, running for males was, for, old, for older men is embarrassing. It's shameful for them. So that shows you the, the depth of his love for his son. And not only that, he embraces his son. He kisses him. And this is the offer that every single one of us have. And I want to throw this out there as well. If you're in this room and you're not a Christian, every other religion offers this idea of you being able to reach, you know, the top level of your faith on your own work. 
okay? And like I was saying, it's not possible. None of us can do it. But also, if you're a, a person that could categorize themselves as atheistic or agnostic, not, you know, you, you don't believe that there is a God or you're not sure that God actually exists, doesn't the world, especially right now, seem a little bit hopeless? Doesn't it seem a little bit like things are spir spiraling out of control? Not just here in America, but all over the world. What you have here in Christianity is a hope beyond this world. It's a hope that there is a God out there who loved you so, enough. Look at what it says, verse 20. Who loved me and gave himself for me. That's where, again, Christianity makes its mark and makes itself unique from the rest of the religions of the world. Because all the other gods are saying, hey, make yourself right before you come to me. Where, where Jesus says, you can't do it, so I'm coming to you. I'm coming your way, and I'm dying for you. Because I love you. Because I'm giving myself for you. So, again, hypocrisy is this way that we... We live thinking that we can make ourselves better. And I want to close with this quote that I, I found this week that I love it. When, you know, whenever, whenever I'm preparing even for a teaching for youth group or for preaching on a Sunday morning, sometimes these things just show up. Somebody posted this on Instagram and I saw this quote. Just had to put it up. One, of my, one, one pastor that I respect and um, enjoy listening to, John Piper, he says, Grace is not simply leniency when we have sinned. Grace is the enabling gift of God not to sin. Grace is power, not just pardon. So I'm telling you, whatever camp you find yourself in, the life of Christ is in you to enable you to live the life that he has created you for. You have not been designed to struggle and be frustrated and to... Um, just have life be so hard and, and make it so difficult on yourself to follow Jesus. You have been made to have a deep, intimate relationship with Jesus that he will enable you to have. So we need to trust in that. We need to recognize that he will enable us to do it. And I want you to think of it like a, a, some, an electronic appliance or elect, you know, something electrical. It doesn't work unless you plug it in. And that's like our hearts. It's not in, in, the, in the life of Christ. The life of Christ is not going to work in your life if you're not plugging into it. Plug in to Jesus and he will give you exactly what you need in order to follow him. Let's pray. God, we are just so thankful, so thankful for, um, for you giving us the life of Christ for you changing our hearts, for you making us into the people you have created us to be. So God, we desire to follow you. We desire for your life to be ours. We desire to move on from our hypocrisy. God, we want to be the kind of people you've created us to be. You've not designed us to be um, frustrated. You've designed us to be close and intimate with you, sensing your freedom, God. So God, we pray for this morning. God, we just, we offer every, our lives to you. We offer um, our hearts to you. And we just thank you in Jesus' name, amen.